Well, it's beautiful to be here in the Eucharistic presence of our Lord. To contemplate really His plan for us, the fact that He made us as His children, He made us for a relationship with Him. <clears throat> and in our longing for Him, that He has placed, I guess we could say indirectly, these seven fundamental longings of our heart that only he can truly ultimately satisfy. Longings for abundance, for dignity, for justice, for peace, for trust, for well-being, and communion. And we will <clears throat> we'll stay here and uh, we're going to basically have about an hour of time with our Lord by the Blessed Sacrament. I will be preaching some of the time, and some of the time will be for your private prayer and reflection. And once again, anybody who wishes to go to confession at any time, our Lord is not displeased if you get up and leave him in order to go make a good confession. That's always, sacraments always trump everything. So, so I was uh, looking at Bible passages and trying to think of, okay, where are we going to find passages that have to do, ones that would be meaningful that have to do with the subject at hand? And I suppose I probably could have gone to the book of Proverbs and found some things, but I was looking for some texts that we could actually kind of meditate on, not just pithy little expressions. And uh, the reality is I was having a hard time. So I gave you three different texts. And if you don't like one, then hopefully one of the other ones will be good. I'm going to try to just limit myself to a few reflections on each one and then allow us really just in the context of this overarching theme of our longing for well-being, of the danger, if you wish, of the sin of gluttony, and of how we satisfy that longing, which is through the virtue of temperance. Now, <clears throat> having said that, it's interesting that these texts do not speak a lot directly about temperance. Uh, the texts that it's, it, 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 if I were to put a finger on what the texts do speak about, it is theological hope. And I think that is a, a nice prism through which to see the virtue of temperance. Because if we look at temperance as just saying, well, okay, you know what? I know you feel like indulging, but it's bad for you, so don't do it. That's not particularly attractive, right? It's like, okay, if I don't do this, bad things will happen. That may be the case, but there's more to the spiritual life. The spiritual life is not just a list of thou shalt nots. Interestingly enough, here's a parenthesis for you. The original Ten Commandments, apparently, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but written in Hebrew, they do not say thou shalt not. They... The, apparently the translation is, I am the Lord your God, and because I am the Lord your God, you do not do this, you do not do that. It's basically an ongoing, it's not a list of prohibitions you shouldn't do in the future, but he's basically saying, how do I live right now? This relationship of love that is grounded in, first of all, I am the Lord your God. Therefore, consequences of this relationship with me is, here are the things that are dangerous. It is a slight, it's... It's a subtle difference, but it, there is a change. Our faith is not a list of just thou shalt nots. So our faith is an invitation to fullness, to relationship, to love with a person who knows you by name, who gave you your name, who loves you as you are, and wants to help you to become the best possible version of yourself. That is the relation. That is what we're meditating this morning. And I think uh, that's the light that we should see the virtue of temperance in. It is a light in which Christ is saying, okay, we can aspire to certain, if you want, lower things, and they're not necessarily bad, but they can't be our ultimate aspirations. The theological virtue of hope is what allows us to aspire to that which is highest, to put our hopes in that which is highest, the thing that we were made for. <clears throat> so in light of that, we'll begin with Matthew chapter 6. Which is, this is a very famous passage. Christ is saying, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They do not sow or reap. They gather nothing into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more important than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single moment to your lifespan? Why are you anxious about clothes? Learn from the way the wildflowers grow. <clears throat> they do not work or spin, but I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed like one of them. If God so clothes the grass of the field which grows today and is thrown into the oven tomorrow, will he not much more provide for you, O you of little faith? So do not worry and say, what are we to eat, what are we to drink, or what are we to wear? All these things the pagans seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you besides. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient for a day is its own evil. <clears throat> if you look at that passage, the overarching theme has to do with do not worry, do not be concerned about don't get wrapped up in. And that is a good context, I think, in which to see the sin of gluttony. Because ultimately, when we fall into excesses in gluttony, be whatever form it may be, you know, just eating too much or being too wrapped up in how exquisite it is or to the, you know, the most the greatest extremes, you know, being a fentanyl addict or something like that, and whatever the particular form of gluttony is, um, what are we doing? We're concerned about, I don't feel satisfied. I don't feel <laughs> fulfilled. And this is going to be my solution. And we can get really wrapped up in, you know, the object of gluttony itself. I was poking around looking for some um, literary examples because I think sometimes it's good to see what are movies and what are literature have to say. And again, with something like gluttony, usually there are some great examples out there, but usually they're so exaggerated. It's like it doesn't really apply to us, right? Um, one hyper exaggerated one, but I don't know how many Lord of the Rings people there are here. Okay, Mary Wolf, not only is she a theologian, but she's the Lord of the Rings buff. Okay. She is the complete woman. She does all things well. <laughs> okay. There was a character, which was not even a human being, but Tolkien did a great job portraying this particular vice. Uh, in the Lord of the Rings, there was a character called Shelob, which was just this immense spider who was a child of Ungoliant. Ungoliant was actually kind of almost a divinity, but also this immense spider. Um, so it's a monster, but it's not just like a household spider that dies in you know a year or so. <laughs> Basically, the spider is eternal. Until something actually up and kills it, it will be there for hundreds and hundreds of years or thousands of years, and it had been. Sheila, you know, was gigantic um, and lived up in this mountain pass and you know, anybody who went through there, she would get them. You know, she was very crafty and she was intelligent. She was evil. She was greedy. She was cruel. She was intelligent. Um, and when the bad guy, Sauron, you know, the, everyone knows at least the basic idea behind the, the story, right? He's got this, he had been trying to take over the world like all bad guys do. If it had been set in more modern times, he would have lived in New York because all monsters always attack New York for some reason. It's like Godzilla and those guys are magnetically attracted to New York. Um, but it's one of these wants to take over the world kind of things. And in some primordial past, he had invested a lot of his power into this one ring. The reason was is that would give him greater control over these other rings. That was kind of the gist of the story. But he was defeated and he lost his ring. And with that, lost most of his power. But a couple thousand years later, he starts coming back. Um, so he's got this kingdom, and she lives on the border of the kingdom. And it's funny because he said it says he knew she was there, and he didn't care. He thought it was great. He said, "Look, 
any monster I come up with is not going to be as good as her. She's doing a better job guarding this pass than anything I'll do. So he just leaves her, and he's totally happy. And it says Sheila doesn't care about rings or kingdoms or empires or towers or anything. The only thing that she cared about was devouring everything she could come across until the mountains could not support her anymore and she was too immense and large to be contained. That was her dream in life. Her only, it was just this all-consuming appetite. And she was cruel. She loved to, you know, she loved the aspect of the, the terror of her victims as she would hunt them down and, you know, get them and watching them panic and everything. Now, I don't think that applies to anybody here. But it is worth noting that the vice of gluttony can lead to other things like cruelty. Um, you think, well, how in the world can Maya have an extra piece of pizza make me cruel? Well, here's the thing. There's a logic. Part of the reason why these sins are sins is when we allow something to become a sin, then it starts to become a habit. And Christ says in the gospel, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And when something enslaves us, then it starts to erode our capacity to make the right judgments. We become addicts. We, again, we see that in the sad consequences of things like um, you know, alcoholism or drug use or even just internet use can make us addicts. But that can actually lead to things that are consequences that we sometimes take very lightly and we shouldn't. Let me give you an example. How many people in this room have had something along the lines of, well, I know we've got to get ready for Sunday mass, but you know, the family and we're having breakfast and it took, it took a little longer getting it together and everything. So, well, I guess we missed mass. And uh, of course there are other masses later in the day, but I couldn't do that because that would change everything. So, um, and we allow something as stupid as our family's breakfast and bacon, eggs, and whatever to say, I didn't get to Mass this weekend. Okay. A priest who hears that in confession is probably going to say, okay, I don't think this was a sin of, you know, wasn't like it was a radically deliberate sin. You did not renounce your faith or whatever. But when you think about it, you were made by God, for God. We were made for a relationship with Christ who chose to become crucified for us and offers himself to us every Sunday and every day if we have the possibility in the Eucharist, in the Mass. And we so lightly allow sometimes something like, well, I had the family over for, it could be, I don't know, Christmas Mass. I had the family over for dinner. I had, we so lightly allow some social event to take away the thing for which we were made. It may sound like an exaggeration to say we were made for the Mass. Well, probably it is an exaggeration, but the Mass is a gift. But we were made for God. And we were saved by what happens in the Mass. And the Mass contains the greatest gifts that we can receive, really, on this side of heaven. And we can so lightly... Or, for example, the other thing is, uh, not just like we skip Mass, but we can so lightly just like, oh, you know, eating all the way up practically to the church door. Well, I guess I didn't respect the fast. It's like, really? When I was, I, I always pick on the Philippines, but when I, was, I was in the Philippines. It's one of those countries where people are very religious and there's some very fine, beautiful religious sentiments. But the idea of the Eucharistic fast, doesn't matter how many different try, ways I tried to say it, you just like, and it's sometimes, you know, good practice in Catholics, but this one just was inconceivable. Like, you mean you can't have anything for an hour before, you know, so you literally will see vendors selling food as people are walking into the church. And they've got like the little, it's kind of like shaved ice thing or like <clears throat> cotton candy. You're like, it might be the priest. They're like, like, I don't care what you sell when they're leaving the church. You're not selling them anything as they go into the church. And the people be, I think, you know, see people inside the church with their Coke or something. You're like, what the heck's wrong with you people? Even Regnum Christi members. Okay, Holy Week mission. This one was, I remember, it was Good Friday. Not like Sunday Mass, but it was Good Friday. 
we're doing a Holy Week mission. Now, that's the hottest time of the year. So it's oppressively hot and humid. You know, it's like 100 degrees and high humidity. Uh, the sun is very strong. But I remember it saying, okay, guys, um, you know, it's Good Friday, fasting and abstinence. Um, yeah, but Father, can we go get a cup of coffee or something? Like that? Okay, look. Good Friday. You can have a cup of coffee, okay? Just make sure you're done with it like an hour before Mass, okay? I'm being magnanimous here. Coffee, it's... A... So... 15 minutes before Mass, up come half a dozen 450-calorie Frappuccinos with whipped cream and caramel. This is, this is called coffee. 15 minutes going into Mass, I'm just like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> and they're all shocked. They're like, is that what could happen? They're like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but this is, again, this is, it sounds innocent and everything, and maybe it is more or less innocent. There's certainly not any malice. But the reality is we can be very light in just allowing ourselves to, oh, I guess I can't receive communion now. I was busy eating a candy bar in the car on the way here. and um, So it can lead to problems. Something that maybe was more, um, a literary example that would be maybe more apropos to us. Did anyone here ever watch the BBC miniseries or read the book? Bride's Head Revisited, yeah. one of these British series. It's a spectacular book. Um, to my surprise, last summer when I was doing my spiritual exercises, a handful of us legionaries were all sitting around talking about our favorite books. By the way, to my surprise, so one of the priests that used to live in this community is an avid reader. I was actually amazed at how much he'd read and, you know, these classic works. I'm not going to mention the name because we're recording, but anyway, I'll tell you later. <laughs> But he runs marathons. So, <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, amongst us, I would say the book that got the most consensus for like best book ever read was probably *Bride's Head Revisited*, which I did not expect. It would arguably be mine. Um, I mean, I'm a big *Lord of the Rings* guy, but um, in terms of well written and something that I, yeah, it's just a spectacular book. It is the story of. Um, it's written in first person. It's the story of this guy, Charles Ryder, who is, a, it's during World War II. Um, he's basically the, the author writing about himself, okay? He's not nobility or anything, but he's a highly, well, highly educated young man. And he becomes friends with this family. It's a Catholic family, minor nobility in England. So that already makes them exotic. Catholic minor nobility, England, strange combination, but they're like holdouts in Catholicism. They're not the king or queen, but I mean, they're very well to do and living that English nobility lifestyle. So the first half of the book is about his friendship with this guy, Sebastian. And then the second half of the book, he falls in love with Sebastian's sister and it's his relationship with her. But overarching, you're watching the dynamics of really the Holy Spirit working in all of this family, all the different characters of the family and kind of moving them all down this path closer to himself. The guy Charles in the story is an agnostic, but by the end of the story, he's a Catholic, and the, the old guy, the old lord of the manor and everything, had fallen away from the faith and was living in sin. But by the end, they get him to confession and whatnot. Well, the first character you become endeared with is this guy, Sebastian. Sebastian and Charles are young Oxford students. Sebastian is tremendously wealthy eccentric and a flagrant alcoholic but he's portrayed as being this kind of lovable alcoholic he's a real nice guy and just going around kind of sloshingly drunk and throwing exotic parties and everything um and everyone realizes man if this guy doesn't clean up his act he's gonna be a real train wreck but he's still lovable in any, anyway but gradually you watch sebastian deteriorate and what happens is he <clears throat> well He's an alcoholic, gets in some trouble, and his mom is the over-controlling, absolutely proper, respectable, respectful British lady, Catholic. And she sees her son Sebastian getting in problems, getting into trouble, so she starts trying to corral him 
And that's exactly what you did not need to do to Sebastian. Part of the reason why he became this alcoholic is he just wanted to be left alone. And, but, you know, there were family expectations and whatnot, so he would be put out there and he would have to live up to certain expectations, but he kept trying to basically run away and just be on his own. And the more that people tried to control him, the more he would just fall deeper and deeper into this hopeless alcoholism. <laughs> and there's this one really awkward dinner engagement where the mom has got everybody there, um, and she's done away with all the alcohol in the house, which was totally, there's this gigantic white elephant in the room. And all the liquor cabinets are all locked up and the bottles are hidden away. And probably every house in the room had liquor in it before. Um, and everybody's, you know, nobody's saying it, but Sebastian is clearly the, what's on everybody's mind. And he shows up to the table and he's just slurringly drunk. And the big question is, who gave it to him? But, so, but his friend describes watching Sebastian show up and he's just embarrassing the way he's, he's acting and talking and he's just all over himself. And he describes it as this, a blow, expected, repeated, falling upon a bruise with no smart or shock of surprise, only the dull and sickening pain and a doubt whether another like it could be born. I thought that was the most amazing description of watching the effects of alcoholism, a form of gluttony, in a person's life. This, these are the things that these little innocent sins of gluttony can lead us to. A blow which is expected. So imagine you've got this big bruise somewhere on you. And you're just waiting for the next blow, and it just keeps landing over and over again. And you're just wondering if you can even endure the next one. And you know it's coming. That was the behavior. <clears throat> so, back to our gospel passage. More cheery materials, don't worry. <laughs> When Christ is saying, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, the magic words here are towards the end. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. <clears throat> when I said during the talk that we have a hierarchy, we're made for God, and as long as he's at the top of the hierarchy of loves, everything else falls into place. It's God, spouse, children, and then if you want extended family, friends, whatever else comes after that. But if we have that pyramid well-founded, then we're in a good place. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you besides. G.K. Chesterton once said, you know, even the, the bawdiest sailor going into a brothel is looking for God. The reason he's going there is, is, is a mistaken way of looking for God. The same can be attributed to, you know, the person who just digs in. A lot of times when we fall into sins of gluttony, you know, just food-related sins of gluttony, you know, what are the causes? Well, how many people here, when you feel stressed, become stress eaters, right? How many of you, I might actually, <laughs> how many of you know people, or maybe yourselves, you know, it's like they, their marriage starts falling apart and then you see them balloon. Okay, what's happening? You're trying to fill a space with the wrong thing. You're looking for love. You're looking for there's a damaged relationship and your compensation is basically just popcorn or whatever your particular thing is. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness when we our tank of love will be filled even really if our spouse doesn't love us or acts like he doesn't love us um, or you know everything else around us is falling apart when we are truly grounded in god we can suffer clearly we can have lots of crosses but when we are truly when we have that relationship of love with god in our deepest essence 
there is the fulfillment of the thing that we most long for. That is why saints can go through so many different trials and difficulties, and nonetheless, they're fundamentally at their deepest core, they're happy. There's a contentment because their conscience tells them, I am living in union with the God that I am made for. Okay, the next text, John chapter 6. This is the multiplication of the loaves, and it is after Jesus has multiplied the loaves. And basically what happened was he sends the apostles across the Sea of Galilee, and he spends the night in prayer on the mountaintop, and then he walks across the water to them, but nobody sees him do it. So the next morning, this is where John chapter 6, verse 22 to 27, it says, The next day, the crowd that remained across the sea saw that there had only been one boat there, Jesus had not gone, etc., etc., etc. They find him on the other side, and they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus, who knows perfectly well where they're coming from, says, Amen, amen, I say to you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, the Father, God has set his seal. So Jesus realizes he had preached to them and they legitimately were clinging to his words. But the minute he gave them the big miracle of food, their intentions changed and they started seeing him as, you know, a material benefactor. And they said, hey, essentially they come looking for him. Hey, you know that bread thing you did yesterday? That was pretty cool. You think you could conjure it up again? And Jesus is way, he says, don't work for that kind of bread. The bread that I want to give you is something much more elevated. It's and Ultimately, he gives them the bread of life discourse, which says my own body and blood, my flesh to eat, the Eucharist. That is the bread that I'm going to give you. And we know the story. Almost everybody leaves him. Even his own 12 apostles were questioning. Jesus has to say, will you two leave me? And then thanks be to God, Peter stepped up and said, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of everlasting life. But it's easy for us to work for other things. And this is actually where I think I came up with that breakfast analogy. When, when we allow ourselves, well, I guess I can't go to communion today because, you know, mass and breakfast and, you know, it was got to get the you know, most important meal of the day. Got to make sure I get that good breakfast in. So if I have to skip out on Jesus, well... You know, and I hear this, so it's not like it never happens, right? Like your confessions sometimes tell me those things. <laughs> so <laughs> finally, we have the text from the letter to the Ephesians. And St. Paul here is, he's exhorting them to a list of different virtues and stuff and telling them, you know, take no part in the fruitless works of darkness, rather expose them. Watch carefully then how you live. So basically saying, uh, pay attention, you know, don't always take the easy way out. Watch carefully how you live, not as foolish persons, but as wise. Therefore, do not continue in ignorance, but try to understand what is the will of God. So again, the fundamental thing here is when we seek God and we seek his will, then we won't fall into the sins of gluttony. And when we do fall into sins and gluttony and everything, it becomes an obstacle to our capacity to seek his will. He says, do not get drunk on wine, in which lies debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So it's interesting. He, had, he makes the analogy here with drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. And what he's really getting at is when we fall into drunkenness, we're looking for a cheap substitute for the thing we really long for. He says, don't settle for cheap substitutes. Don't settle for something that's not really going to fill you. You are made to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the joy that comes from Him. And sometimes we let ourselves settle for these, you know, we medicate ourselves, if you want, to cover up, you know, those wounds because we don't want to deal with them. Well, sometimes those wounds are precisely the entryways for the Holy Spirit to come in. 
frankly speaking, if God is allowing you to experience wounds and woundedness, it's not because he's mean or because he doesn't know they're there. It's because those are entryways to let him in. A book that I recommend a lot is The Gift of Faith by Thaddeus Deicher. Also the same book, different title, Inquiring Faith. It's the exact same book. He refers to the fact that if we don't have any cracks in our armor, we become impervious to God. And the reason is because God made you free. God will not force himself on anybody. You have to freely let him in. But if you think you're so bulletproof that you don't need him, then he's not coming in. And we can get there. So on the other extreme is if we try to medicate then our woundedness and our wounds, covering up with all these other things, for example, in this case, gluttony, sins of gluttony, um, then we won't be aware enough of the ache to allow God in to do his thing. 